An Introduction to Bioinformatics. So the aims and objectives for this session are first of all to introduce some concepts in bioinformatics and by the end of the session you should be able to describe why it's important, discuss the importance of sequenced data and databases, give examples of data banks and show the difference between a data bank, a database and a search tool, describe how bioinformatics can be used in genome sequencing and describe some of the problems with data resources and the process of sequence alignment. So what is bioinformatics? Well, everyone's definition is different, but a simple definition is the application of computers to problems in biology. And we can expand that to say that it involves aiding the biologist in creating, storing and analysing biological data Particularly, we're talking about sequences and structures, and these days also various types of omics data, things like genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and so on. Presenting those data in a way that biologists can make use of, and applying uh, analysis to make predictions. So, overall, what are we trying to achieve? Well, we have the basic ideas of biology here that DNA sequence encodes protein sequence that encodes protein structure that then goes on to perform a function. So what we're trying to do with bioinformatics is understand information about DNA sequences, protein sequences, protein structures and how that relates to function and indeed to predict how we get from a DNA sequence to a protein sequence. Of course that's a simple translation process but we need to predict which bits are going to be translated. We need to try to predict how we get from a protein sequence to a structure and predict how that influences protein function. And once we understand all those things, we can try to modulate protein function. And that may be the design of drugs which inhibit an enzyme, uh, or it may be design of drugs that are able to reactivate a damaged protein. Let's set the scene with a bit of background about data. Biology is now overwhelmed with data. Traditionally, it was quite a data-poor subject. People went out and drew pictures of animals or plants and just collated simple information. But now, with sequencing methods, structural methods, omics methods, there are just huge amounts of data. The human genome itself is about 3.2 gigabase pairs in size. That's 3.2 billion base pairs of DNA and that's enough raw data to fill about five CD-ROMs or one DVD and that information is being carried around in every cell of your body. The DNA sequence data banks are now around about 9,900 gigabase pairs in size. So you can see how much that has increased over the last uh, 15 years or so because um, it was originally stated in August of 2005 that the data had passed 100 gigabase pairs. Uh, but they uh, said that again in August 2007 uh, because they changed the way that the counting was done. There was some redundancy in the original count. So just comparing that uh, 9,900 gigabase pairs with numbers from a year ago, 6,300, two years ago, 3,700, and uh, uh, three years ago it was 2,700. So you can see how it's been going up hugely. Another way of looking that, uh, at that is that it's about the equivalent of 3,000 human genomes, a huge is a human genome equivalent. So it's like having uh, sequenced the human genome 3,000 times over. Last year it was only 1,991. Now 
You might think that's a little bit strange because you might have heard of things like the Thousand Genomes Project or the uh, UK 10K Project to uh, sequence 10,000 genomes or the ongoing UK 100K Project to sequence 100,000 genomes. So if we're sequencing all these genomes, why is there only about uh, 3,000 human, human genome equivalents in the databanks? Well, the answer is when we sequence human genomes, we don't need to store all the information because most of them, uh, most of the DNA is very similar. So we just store the differences between the different genomes. Yet another way to look at the amount of data is that it's about 3,200 years issues of the New York Times. And again, that was just over 2,000 a year ago. So that's just looking at DNA data. Uh, in addition, we have a lot of protein structure data. So uh, about 151,600 protein structures uh, in the databases at the moment. Uh, and that was um, about 147,500 a year, year ago. So you can see that that is not uh, increasing at the same sort of rate. So from this, we can see that DNA data doubles roughly every 18 to 24 months, while the structure data doubles round about every six years or so. Returning to the human genome, as I said, that's about 3.2 gigabase pairs, 3.2 billion base pairs of DNA. That's about 30 times the size of something like C. elegans or Drosophila. However, less than 5%, probably about 2 to 3% of the DNA encodes proteins. And more than 50% of it consists of simple repeated sequences. So that small amount of coding DNA uh, probably codes for something like 20,000 proteins. However, about 35% of those genes have what's called alternative splicing. In other words, one gene can have its exons spliced together in different ways to produce somewhat different proteins. And there are roughly three splice variants on average per gene. So that means that rather than uh, about 20,000 proteins, we're actually able to produce uh, something more like 60,000. Coming back then to the more bioinformatic side of things, a uh, major topic is data storage. And it can be quite useful to make a distinction between a database and a data bank. This is not something that everybody does, but it is quite common. So, a database is a structured collection of data which is hidden behind some specific search tool enabling it to be queried. Now, good examples of uh, a database is what we call a, a relational database. So I'm sure pretty much all of you have used uh, Microsoft tools. The extra member of the Microsoft Office suite is Microsoft Access, which is what's called a relational database. So once you've stored data in that database, the only way of accessing those data is via Microsoft Access. On the other hand, a data bank is a collection of data normally just stored in simple text files. So just plain text. And that means that there's no fixed associated query tool. Instead, you can use different query tools depending what you want to find out. So a database can be very efficient. It can also be hidden behind a, a, a web interface. So that's your uh, one way of accessing the data. Whereas a data bank is a resource that you can query in whatever way you wish. Most data for uh, 
bioinformatics is in the form of a data bank. Uh, and we can divide these into different levels. We have primary data banks. Those are raw data, so things like protein sequences, protein structures, and so on. We can have secondary data banks, which are derived data. So if we're talking about a, a family of proteins, we can look at patterns that are characteristic of that family. Also, secondary data banks generally have things like detailed annotations related to the protein family. Thirdly, we have composite data banks. These are generally non-redundant sets of data that have been derived from pr primary data banks. So people collect data about, for example, protein sequences from different resources and then integrate them and make sure that the same sequence doesn't appear multiple times. And finally, we have what are known as gateways, which are resources, usually on the web, to access data and produce links between different data banks and allow you some form of integrated access across multiple resources. So a few examples then of primary data banks. GenBank, EMBL, ENA and DDBJ are three resources which contain DNA sequence data. GenBank is the American one, EMBL, ENA is the European one and DDBJ is the Japanese one. Now all three of these actually exchange data on a very regular basis but they use somewhat different formats and different tools for depositing data and for searching data. Uniprot KB slash Swissprot and Uniprot KB slash Tremble are protein sequence resources. So these are linked together. The Swissprot resource contains very carefully annotated sequences whereas the Tremble resource contains automatic translations of DNA data from EMBL ENA. So the characteristic of a primary data bank is that it contains simple sequence data, uh, or indeed other ones contain structure data, but these examples are all sequence data, and that can be DNA or protein uh, in these cases. They may also have what's known as feature information, things like splice sites in DNA, signal sequences in proteins, disulfides, active sites, etc., etc. And the DNA data banks may also contain the translations to protein sequences, uh, whether those are actually known or they're predicted. It's important to note then that since the gene prediction methods are imperfect, a protein that's identified purely from genomic data is labelled as hypothetical until it's been verified by experiment. So some other examples of primary data banks include the PDB, the Protein Data Bank, which contains protein structural data, and the Enzyme Data Bank, which contains enzyme classification information, or so-called EC numbers. Some examples then of secondary data banks are things like ProSite, Prints, Blocks and Interpro. As I said before, a secondary data bank contains derived information and generally has patterns that characterise a protein family, as well as detailed annotations. ProSite is the oldest and simplest of these uh, secondary data banks and it contains what we call regular expressions describing patterns of amino acids that occur in proteins. Now these patterns can be divided into two types. The first type describes functional features of proteins, whereas the second type describes protein families.
The first example then, protein kinase C phosphorylation site, is one of these functional features. So the pattern here consists of S or T, that's the square brackets mean or, so that's serine or threonine, followed by one of anything, followed by arginine or lysine. So every protein kinase C phosphorylation site contains this pattern, but not necessarily every time you see that pattern will it be a protein kinase C phosphorylation site. In other words, this pattern is necessary but not sufficient. The second example is an N-linked glycosylation site. This consists of an N, asparagine, followed by the curly brackets mean not, so anything other than proline, followed by serine or threonine, followed by anything other than proline. So again, that was one of these functional sites. The third example then is related to a protein family known as the Kringle domain. And this pattern consists of phenylalanine or tyrosine, followed by cysteine, followed by arginine or histidine, followed by asparagine or serine. And then the X7,8 means somewhere between 7 and 8 of anything. Then tryptophan or tyrosine, and then a cysteine. One of the most fundamental things that we need to be able to do with protein or DNA sequence data is to compare it. And the idea of comparisons really relies on a concept known as a dot plot. So what I've done here is to plot one protein sequence along the top and another sequence down the left hand side. And everywhere that the two sequences match, I've put a red blob. So you can see a glycine with a glycine, serine with a serine, and so on. Now, if you stand back a little bit from the screen, you should be able to see that there is an approximate diagonal here indicating that the two sequences are related to one another. If I do that with two real sequences, in this case I've taken one sequence and compared it against itself, you can see a perfect diagonal going down the middle. <coughs> now what I did in that previous slide was to use what's known as identity scoring. In other words, I put a little blob wherever the two amino acids were the same. Now that's a perfectly sensible thing to do for DNA, but in the case of proteins, it's less meaningful. So that simple identity scoring, if you're doing it with numbers, it would be one for a match, zero for a mismatch. But in reality, of course, certain amino acids are more similar to one another than others. So for example, serine and threonine are almost identical, except that threonine has a little extra CH3 group attached to it. So we could compare amino acids on the basis of physicochemical characteristics, but much more typically what we do is use a scoring matrix to compare each of the amino acids from the analysis of a set of aligned homologous proteins. In other words, we're looking at which amino acid substitutions are observed in homologous families. This was first done by Margaret Dayhoff in 1978 and was improved by Hennikoff and Hennikoff in 1992 to produce the so-called Blossom matrices which are frequently used these days in comparing sequences and searching databanks to find related sequences. So let's go on to look at those two topics of aligning sequences and searching databanks. First of all, what do we mean by an alignment? So here I've taken the same uh, pair of sequences that we looked at in that original dot plot. So by alignment I could mean what we see here, 
that we've aligned L, D, S and L. Or I could mean what we've shown here, which is to align G, S and L. Or even we could mean this, where we're aligning this S and L. But in reality, what we generally mean is that we insert gaps into one or both sequences to optimize the number of matches. So in this case, we've inserted two gaps into this second sequence so that both the GSL at this end and the DSL at this end are aligned with one another. Now in this particular case, uh, it's not a completely unambiguous alignment because this L here could align with this one or with this one, as I've done in the right-hand example. And we would need more information uh, from structure or from having a multiple alignment of many other related sequences to know conclu conclusively which of those is correct. Now, how do we get from the dot plot that we saw before to an actual alignment in some sort of automated fashion? Well, we use a technique known as dynamic programming. This was first applied to sequence alignment by two authors, Needleman and Wunsch, in 1970. Now, in fact, Needleman and Wunsch were two medics. They had never published a bioinformatics type paper ever before. They invented this, this approach and they published this paper in 1970 and really they've never published anything again since. However, this remains one of the most cited papers in bioinformatics ever. What this does is essentially takes our dot plot or matrix that uh, we saw before and works from one corner to another trying to accumulate scores. It turns out that this method was actually already well known in the computer science field and is used to tr solve a class of problem known as the traveling salesman problem. So if you imagine you have uh, a salesman who has to go between a set of different cities to sell his product, then what is the optimum path between those cities, taking into account things like uh, distance, speed of the roads, likely traffic, and so on, in order to, um, to, to be as efficient as possible. It's also used in things like uh, sequencing of traffic lights to optimize traffic flow. Now, what Needleman and Wunsch actually discovered was a process known as global sequence alignment. So if you imagine the green and brown lines are two sequences, it's basically taking the whole of one sequence and the whole of another sequence and introducing gaps such that the whole sequence of, in green aligns with the whole sequence in brown. Now, it was Sw Smith and Waterman, some 11 years later, who realized that what Needleman and Wunsch had done was actually this concept of dynamic programming that had been used in computer science previously. And they realized that a simple modification to the method could produce what's known as local sequence alignment. In other words, you take one region from one sequence and align it automatically with a region from another sequence. Now, the reason that that is important is because protein sequences and DNA sequences are often split up into domains. So you can consider a domain as being a unit of inheritance. So we can have domain A associated with domain B in one protein and domain A associated with domain C in another protein. Now, if you try to align those using global sequence alignment, then OK, it would get domain A aligned pretty much properly, but it would be trying to align domain B with domain C, and these are completely unrelated, so the alignment would make no sense. 
On the other hand, with a local sequence alignment, it would automatically align A with A and simply ignore the B with C part. Now, dynamic programming is incredibly useful, but it's slow. And that means with the huge amounts of data that we saw at the beginning of the lecture, it becomes completely impractical to use dynamic programming to search one sequence against all the other sequences to look for homology. So instead what we do is use fast methods known as heuristics. So a heuristic is a method that uh, is guaranteed to get a good result but might not get the very best result. And the way that the two major programs that do this function is to create an index. So these two programs are called FASTA and BLAST. Uh, what they do is take the database of sequences and split them up into short words. We take the words from the probe sequence, look them up in the index, and then look for multiple matches and extend to find likely full hits by using a full alignment method. So you can think of that in terms of a normal book. If we had a book uh, in which every word in the book was indexed instead of just certain keywords, and we were looking for a particular sentence, then we could look in the index for each word in our sentence and see which pages it appears on. We then choose the page which has the most hits, and then we read that page in detail to try to find the sentence of interest. And of course it wouldn't matter if there were some mismatches, like some of the words were were incorrect in the, uh, uh, in the sentence that we were searching with um, because we would still find the right page and that detailed reading of the page like the proper full alignment would find the actual part that we were looking for. At that stage we're going to take a break and move on to the second part of the lecture where we will look at more applications of bioinformatics.